For big cat declawing, a big pause. An historic federal court decree, thanks to a PETA lawsuit. How you can help enforce it on the PETA Podcast. Welcome to the PETA Podcast. I'm Emil Guillermo, your host for this behind-the-scenes look at PETA, the largest animal rights organization in the world. Here we talk to key players at PETA and the movement and ask them about how animal rights change their lives and how they stay motivated to make the world a better place for the animals. On today's episode, Big Cat Declawing, essentially the mutilation of the big cat. It's a practice that still goes on in the U.S. despite general condemnation, especially by animal shows that feature photo ops with tiger cubs. Declawing doesn't make things safer. It actually makes cats more aggressive because you're depriving them of one of their defenses. And so it actually um, can make them more mean. And because they can't use their claws... Um, they're instead going to use their extremely powerful jaws that will kill you. Brittany Pete is an attorney and director of captive animal law enforcement at PETA. PETA sued one show run by Tim Stark, who used a vet, Dr. Rick Pelfrey, to declaw up to 13 tiger cubs. The suit against Stark's wildlife in need is ongoing. But the vet, Pelfrey, settled with PETA. And last week, a judge made legal history. As a result of that settlement, we got a consent judgment from uh, the federal district court uh, in this in the southern district of Indiana um, that says that the unnecessary and it's always unnecessary declawing of big cats violates the Endangered Species Act. Period. So now we have a federal court order, federal precedent that says that the mutilation of the, the, the claws of big cats violates the law. More on declawing and why it's painful and how you can help enforce a new legal precedent next on the PETA podcast. But first, thanks again for joining us here at the PETA podcast. This is a milestone show, number 40. And after just nine months, we're getting thousands of downloads each month. Thank you. But the animals still need your help. Spread the word, share a link with friends, let all your contacts know the animals have a voice on the PETA podcast. And if you're new to our show, please binge. Podcasting is the new radio. Turn us on when you're driving, at work, or at home. Get to know PETA president and co-founder Ingrid Newkirk in episode one. Or start with this one and go backwards. See what PETA did for the companion animals adrift during and after Hurricane Florence in episode 36. Find out about how stopping the transport of monkeys can help end animal experimentation. That's episode 38. Texas A&M dog abuse? Well, check out episode 9. And if you're going vegan, episode 25 has some tips. Remember, if you're on Apple Podcasts, don't forget to rate and review the show. It helps the algorithm know that PETA has a podcast on the issues important to you. Now, if you really want to help the animals, you can always hit the Donate Now button at PETA.org. And if you're high-tech and have Amazon's Alexa, it's as easy as saying, Alexa, donate to PETA. And now to our episode. Brittany Pete is an attorney and director of Captive Animal Law Enforcement at PETA. Here's my conversation with her on the decline of big cats and why it's more than a manicure, it's mutilation. And how PETA's lawsuit against a vet, Dr. Rick Pelfrey, and an animal showrunner, Tim Stark's Wildlife in Need, has created a legal precedent that will hopefully stop declawing of big cats in the U.S. My conversation with Brittany Pete on the PETA podcast. So, Brittany... Thank you for joining us on the PETA podcast. The last time uh, you were on the PETA podcast, you spoke about bears. And today you're talking about tigers. So thank you for being with us. Yes, of course. You had a victory recently involving decline. And I'm guessing our listeners really don't have an idea about how tigers are declawed. Uh, What was your breakthrough on this issue, on on decline? PETA is currently suing uh, one of the the worst tiger exhibitors uh, in 
the United States um, over a number of of cruel practices that he inflicts on on tigers and on tiger cubs specifically. And one of the most egregious is the fact that he declaws lion and and tiger cubs uh, when they're just a few weeks old. And uh, what most people don't understand is that declawing isn't just um, just taking off claws or, you know, it's not analogous to um, pulling off one of our fingernails or trimming our fingernails. It's actually an amputation um, mm-hmm. of what is essentially a tiger's finger um, at the first joint. And it causes long-term um, lameness, arthritis. Um, a lot of the cats who undergo this surgery um, have have infections and and regrowth, and in basically one hundred percent of the cases, there are long term physical effects that these cats suffer. One of the things I notice is that when you say declawing, like you point out, it's not like trimming your fingernails. I mean, you think, oh, declawing is just oh, that's just like a, you know a little snip of the sharp point, so they can be friendly and you know and file mm-hmm. them down, and they can shake your hands and all that kind of thing. But it's actually, you know, much more than that. And when you say the first knuckle, I mean, PETA has a graphic, has made a graphic showing the first mm-hmm. knuckle. So you actually go, you look at your hand, and if you go underneath your fingernail, like to the the first knuckle under mm-hmm. is the one underneath your fingernail, which is, mm-hmm. I mean, I would think the knuckle is the one that, you know, like hits the table, right? But it's the first knuckle, which is, Right underneath the nail. And I can't imagine a tiger. Well, I can't imagine getting my fingers trimmed right there mm-hmm. at the first knuckle. How bad is it for a tiger? I guess you practically are are physically disabling him. That is completely that's that's that is one hundred percent correct. In addition to the the long term medical issues, it also deprives tigers and, and lions of the ability to engage in some of their most natural behaviors. It prevents them from being able to use uh, their claws for gripping. They use them for balance. Um, there are, uh, there's a, there's a huge number of things that they use their claws for and uh, declawing them deprives them of that. And so in addition to the, the physical and medical issues that it causes, it also causes, um, extreme psychological distress for for the animals long term and this is all reflected by the fact that 8 years ago the the AVMA the American Veterinary Medical Association condemned the decline of of big cats and wild and exotic cats um and the American Association of Zoological Veterinarians did the same thing um recognizing that that these surgeries these amputations cause these long term complications and psychological and physical issues for these cats. Um, but there are still a few veterinarians across the country who will do it despite those condemnations. Well, the people who want it done and who want the veterinarians to do it, you know, the, the people want to, are the ones who actually will be dealing with the, the animals and they don't want to be scratched. So they declaw the animals. Right. And, it's mm-hmm. basically guys like this guy Rick Pelfrey, who has uh, the his his show Wildlife in Need, right? I mean, they're the people who do the decline, right? Right. So, so Dr. Rick Pelfrey is actually the attending veterinarian for Wildlife in Need. Wildlife in Need is operated by a man named Tim Stark, um, and PETA sued both of them separately under the Endangered Species Act. Dr. Pelfrey, we sued specifically for his conduct in declining. Uh, big cats. He declawed around 13 cats um, over the course of of three years. Um, That's what he admitted to. Um, Several of those cats died, including two tiger cubs who just a few weeks after they were declawed um, were found by the U.S. Department of Agriculture's own inspectors struggling to walk, vocalizing in pain and bleeding. And mm. the the cubs were so bad off that Tim Stark actually forged paperwork and hid the cats from the USDA inspectors. Um, and the USDA 
wouldn't have been able to to see them um but they they demanded to to see them and then and then Stark had to admit that he'd locked the cubs away um in a room because he was he was embarrassed over their condition and he knew that he would be in trouble if they were seen um unfortunately as we know um the USDA has a long history of failing to adequately enforce the law. They should have confiscated those cubs that day. They should have confiscated those cubs and got them appropriate veterinary care. But instead, they left them there and they died just mm. a few weeks later. Well, so we have Dr. Rick Pelfrey, who's the veterinarian, who's really the uh, the enabler. And we have Stark, right. who is the guy who runs the show Wildlife in Need. And he knew he was in the wrong he's trying to hide it and then Peta came in and sued both of them that's right so so Peta initially sued tim stark and wildlife in need um and we sued we sued them over um the declining of big cats um and the the crux of stark's business is uh these big cat cub encounters he calls them tiger cub playtime so he charges members of the public to come in and sit in a room um and then baby tigers and baby lions and, and hybrids um, will be released into the room. Um, a lot of times they'll, the, these encounters will be done eight different times throughout the day. Um, and these are cubs who spent in the wild would spend most of their time sleeping and resting. Um, mm -hmm. But instead they're forced to be awake and engaging with the public and USDA inspectors have also cited Stark over the cubs being physically exhausted, having to be literally dragged by the tail, their tails, because they're so mm -hmm. exhausted from being forced to perform constantly. So PETA also sued over uh, the use of cubs in these performances and over the traumatic premature separation of these, these babies from, from their mothers. They would, they would normally stay with them for, for up to two years, but for these photo ops, um, they're separated from their mothers shortly after they're born. And, and of course, to do all this, you can't really do all this unless they're declawed because people can be badly mauled just by, you know, an, an innocent, uh, you know, cubs pawing, um, the claws would hurt. So you have to declaw, right? I mean, I mean, that's why Stark and went to Pelfrey in the first place, right? Well, that's where some of the hypocrisy comes in because there are a lot of these, these outfits that are doing these encounters ac across the country, um, that aren't declawing. And Stark does not declaw every cat. Um, he mm. says that it makes the cats easier for him to handle as, as they get older. Um, that's also incorrect. According to reputable actual experts, um, it can act it actually makes cats more aggressive because you're depriving them of one of their defenses. And so it actually um, can make them more mean. And because they can't use their claws, um, they're instead going to use their extremely powerful jaws that will kill you. Um, so mm. it actually doesn't make anyone safer. Um, of course, Star Stark has had a number of incidents where members of the public have been clawed by those, those sharp tiger cub claws but um you know that's that's another reason why these tiger cub photo ops shouldn't be um happening in the first place um but yeah. as we uh pursued uh the case we learned more about dr pelfrey's um uh, involvement in the the declawing of of these big cats the number of cats that he declawed um the issues that a lot of the cats were having following the declaws and the fact that Dr. Pelfrey doesn't believe that tigers experience pain as humans do. So, so he wasn't providing these cats that, that he declawed with any pain medication. These cubs Ooh. who were obviously suffering, bleeding, struggling to walk and vocalizing an obvious pain were not being provided with any pain relief because Pelfrey didn't think that they needed it. So after learning all of that information, we decided that we had to file an Endangered Species Act lawsuit against Dr. Pelfrey too um, for for his conduct in harming and and harassing tiger, lion, and hybrid cubs uh, by performing these completely unnecessary mutilations uh, of animals. Well, that's what it is exactly. It's mutilation of the animals, and you know you're you're 
you're you're causing them physical deformity and well how many cats did dr pelfrey do this to exactly we we don't know exactly how many um but we based on the records that we've seen um it seems to be 12 or 13 mm -hmm. yeah and how many cap how many of the the tigers and how many of the cats are now in captivity or where are they now uh the ones that you know did not uh you know die and and mm -hmm. where do they come from in, in general these these tigers and big cats a lot of the cats that that stark has had declawed over the years some some are still with him uh some have been sent sent away to other roadside zoos um and it's the same story um when you talk about where the cats are coming from in some cases stark is breeding these cats himself in other cases they're they're coming in from other roadside zoos across the country that are that are breeding cats and that's that's one of the most insidious points about the the tiger cub photo op industry is that these cubs can only be used for two or three months um, before they're too big and dangerous to be used with the public and so there's this constant cycle of breeding and and then using the cubs in the photo ops and then discarding the cubs so um it's created a huge captive tiger overpopulation crisis in the united states where do these captive tigers go i mean they... that's one of the big questions we know that that a lot of them are um either sold or uh traded or um, just given away to other roadside zoos where they suffer in tiny cages for the rest of their lives. Uh, some of the cats are used for breeding. Some of them are sold to private owners, um, and, you know, where they'll live in, in backyards for the rest of their lives or mm. until they, they escape. Um, I spoke to one of the most notorious breeders uh, in the country uh, last fall. And and he told me, frankly, that a lot of these exhibitors are just killing the cubs after they get to be too big to be used. And that the the, the practice is just to um, omit a number of cubs from their, their USDA inventories. USDA requires these exhibitors to keep track of how many animals that they have on hand. So, you know, they get three cubs in, they might want to keep one. So they just put one on the inventory and there really aren't any consequences for it. The worst thing that'll right. happen is USDA comes in, notices that there are two cubs missing from, from the inventory and maybe the USDA issues them a citation for it, but there's no penalty for the citation. Um, so it's, it's really a no lose situation for them. Well, so here's a situation where the cubs come, they, they get the clawed, they're in pain, no anesthetic. They get used mm -hmm. in these photo ops for, for people. They, they, you get to play with a cub and get your picture taken. They get too big after a while and then they're abandoned, but now they're declawed. They're kind of abnormal cats. They become not cubs or adults and mm -hmm. they either get sold to roadside zoos where they can't really be used as, you know, people can't have these intimate, uh, kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, things with that. You can't like go up to them. I mean, they're, they're cats, big cats mm -hmm. with no claws, but you wouldn't want to like go up to them and nuzzle next to them. Right. It's be too dangerous for that. Right. I oh, mean, what, what would their yeah. value be to the roadside zoo? Just as there they are, they're, they're away. They're like at least 30 feet away or more cage. And you look at them and, but they're miserable, you know, abnormal big cats now because they've been declawed. You know, and, and that's one of the other things that we're that we're suing Tim Stark over is the the inadequate conditions of confinement for for all of the cat all of the cats, including the adult cats. And PETA also has a separate Endangered Species Act lawsuit against a roadside zoo called Dade City's Wild Things, which is located in Florida, um, that also engages in in tiger cub photo ops, and and PETA is also suing that facility. Uh, for premature separation of cubs from their mothers, for uh, forcing these cubs to engage in photo ops and encounters with the public, and again for confining these adult cats in in really horrible conditions at Dade City's Wild Things, um, 
describing the enclosures that that the adult cats are held in, even calling them prison cells is um, is being too generous. There may be ten by ten, completely barren. Um, PETA did an undercover investigation at the facility a couple of years ago, um, and you know they ju- they warehouse these cats in tiny cramped enclosures where these animals just spend their days pacing back and forth. Um, and most of these animals aren't even included on the public tour uh, because even they understand that the public would be outraged if they saw animals being held in these conditions. Um, but in, in the case of Dade City's Wild Things, a lot of those cats were used for breeding. Yeah, but now all of this is creating a kind of big cat underground. It, it, as you were saying, and then may, maybe an overpopulation of these declawed big cats who can't, who are really of no use. Uh, you know, the, you can't, you couldn't send them back into the wild and you wouldn't want to, you know, send them back to another circus or another roadside circus. What is PETA doing to try to rescue, rescue these tigers? And how do you rescue a declawed tiger? What, what, it, what, how would mm-hmm. you? How would the declawed tiger exist if not in a roadside zoo or, you know, in the mm-hmm. hands of these, uh, you know, the people who declawed them in the first place? Not all of the cats who come out of these photo ops are, are declawed. Certainly many of the ones that came out of Stark's place were. Um, we, we did have a, um, a circumstance in the Dade City's Wild Things case last year where um, whenever, whenever we file these lawsuits against these roadside zoo operators, um, you know, th- these are people who make breaking the law, um, you know, sort of their, their modus operandi. And so they, they don't comply with court orders. And, and that was, that was the case with Dade City's wild things. And, um, they, they engaged in, in a number of underhanded maneuvers, including, um, sending all of their tigers, uh, out of the facility or transferring, transferring all of their tigers out of the facility. Um, in advance of PETA's court ordered, uh, inspection of the facility as part of our Endangered Species Act lawsuit. Um, and so after they did that, they sent 19 of the tigers to this roadside zoo in Oklahoma, uh, called the Gerald Wayne, or I'm sorry, the Greater Winniewood Exotic Animal, uh, park. And, um, and, and that's the place that is ground zero for the breeding of uh, captive mm. tigers and hybrids, um, and has kind of been the the spoke in the wheel of where these tigers are coming from and then being sent across the country. So after Dade City sent those nineteen cats out to Oklahoma, um, they did that in the in the middle of July. The nineteen cats were transferred in a cattle trailer with absolutely no climate control. Um, they were rarely provided with water. And when they arrived in Oklahoma, they were dehydrated and panting. One of the cubs drank out of a mud puddle for five minutes. She was so desperate for water. Um, but what that all came down to was it was contempt of court because PETA had PETA had a right to inspect those animals. They were evidence in the case. So uh, PETA uh, brought a contempt motion against Dade City's Wild Things. Um, that is still working its way through the courts, but we also brought a contempt motion against the operators of that zoo in Oklahoma. Um, and as a result of that, um, they did not want to be involved in litigation with PETA. And so we were able to get a settlement that allowed us to rescue those 19 tigers from the Oklahoma roadside zoo. And as a result of conversations with, with the zoo in Oklahoma, we were also then subsequently able to rescue 20 more tigers from that awful oh. roadside zoo in Oklahoma. And many of those cats were, were cats that had come from Tim Stark's uh, tiger, tiger baby playtimes. And several of those cats were declawed. And um, the, the sanctuary that took them in is continuing to deal with the aftermath of, of that. There's a, a veterinarian named uh, Dr. Jennifer Conrad who is at the forefront of the the declining the, the fight against decline in the United States and um, and she is is typically the person who performs corrective surgery on on declaws and you can't right. make it go away you I mean, can't make the pain go away but you can help 
Yeah. So basically, uh, being after you're declawed, it doesn't. It's not like a death sentence. You can do something so that the the tiger or the cat can be useful again. But it's, I mean, not all of the rescued cats are are declawed. Is is from what I guess <laughs> gather from what you're saying. That's right. right? And so, That's right. but but it's more difficult to place a declawed. Right. Well, yeah, absolutely, and the and the the cost of care for the sanctuary will be will be significantly more, and um, because they because they'll have to almost certainly invest in in corrective surgery for the cat, and even with the corrective surgery, uh, that the cat will likely end up suffering from uh, arthritis and. And, and other lameness related issues throughout their lives. And so there, there's likely to be a significant veterinary cost in, in taking in declawed cats in particular. So what do listeners need to know uh, to, if they want to help stop this? I mean, Peter's doing what it can with, with lawsuits. If people stop going to the, the tiger cup shows and doing all that, could that alone stop? people from declawing cats? Absolutely. Absolutely. That is what it all comes down to. Uh, we could we could walk away and go home and turn our attention to some other horrendous cruelty that's happening to animals if people would just stop giving these exhibitors money to to hold and have their photo taken with a tiger cub. It's as simple as that. Um, these the mm-hmm. tiger cubs are not having fun. They should be with with their mothers. It's traumatic for both the mothers and the cubs. Um, we know that there are horrendous long term psychological consequences for the cubs who are separated from their mothers, whether they're declawed or not. Um, and it, and it also it causes this horrible cycle of cruelty where female tigers are constantly bred. Um, their cubs are constantly taken away from them. Um, for these, these cruel public photo ops, the tiger cubs, uh, don't have, um, uh, fully developed immune systems until after they're too large to be used in the photo ops. So they're also susceptible to a, a number of zoonotic diseases from members of the public. And a lot of the cubs die from that as well. So there's no upside. And, um, so I'm sure a lot of the listeners know this already, but one of the most important things that everyone can do is to share this information on your social network. And every time you see one of your Facebook friends or Instagram friends posting um, about posing with one of these animals, tell them why, explain to them why it's wrong. Refer them to us if you need to. We'll talk to them about it. What should they do if they see tigers at a gas station or a hotel or some other li- unlikely place? Can always reach out to you can always reach out to us and and let us know the the, the first thing that you want to do is is get out your phone and take some video for us. Um, the more video, the better. Uh, we can always we can always use it even if we even if we know about the exhibit already, uh, and then send it over to us and we'll look into it. And you say that this is really as simple as cutting down the demand. If people weren't going to these things. We wouldn't have declining problems. That's absolutely right. These these exhibitors are only uh, engaging in this behavior because they're able to make a lot of money off um, getting you know allow forcing these these cubs to pose to pose for photos. And um, we could stop this tomorrow if people would just would just stop going. What do they charge for uh, a, a pose with a tiger cub or some playtime with a tiger cub? It really varies. The lowest I've I've seen is about twenty five bucks a pop. Um, Dade City's Wild Things down in Florida uh, would charge visitors two hundred dollars to to swim with a tiger cub. Um, this is also happening with other species. There's a, an awful roadside zoo in in Miami that charges two hundred dollars for two minutes with a baby chimpanzee, uh, and it's an epidemic across the country. And, and it's something that we really need to stop. And and Brittany, once again, the historic nature of this suit that uh, you know that you waged against, or that PETA waged against Rick Pelfrey, the veterinarian, and Tim Stark. Tell me again the historic nature of this and why it's uh, such a breakthrough. 
Yeah. So, so PETA's suit against wildlife and need in Tim Stark is, is still ongoing. Um, but last week we reached a settlement with Dr. Pelfrey. Um, and as a result of that settlement, we got a consent judgment from, uh, the federal district court, um, uh, in this, in the Southern district of Indiana, um, that says that the unnecessary, and it's always unnecessary, declawing of big cats violates the Endangered Species Act, period. So now we have a federal court order, federal precedent that says that the mutilation of the, the, the claws of big cats violates the law. And, uh, it's a huge step. And it was, it was one of the main goals that we wanted to accomplish with, with this suit. And, and it's not just that. We also uh, got an agreement from Dr. Pelfrey that he will not treat uh, any of the big cats at wildlife in need. And um, he will never treat any big cat ever again. Uh, because he is not qualified. Anyone who thinks that tigers don't experience pain should not be treating them. And basically, having this precedent means that any other veterinarian who tries to declaw would be in violation of the Endangered Species Act. That's right. That's exactly how we we interpret this this consent judgment. And it it acts as as a deterrent against veterinarians as well. Tim Stark said in the media last week that he intends to continue uh, trying to have mm. have big cats declawed, but he acknowledged that as a result of this agreement, it's probably going to be really difficult for him to find anyone who will do it, and and that's exactly what we're what we're trying to do. These inscrutable wild animal exhibitors are, are going to try to get away with everything that they can get away with. Um, but, you know, if we can come up with creative ideas to prevent them from doing it, like disincentivizing veterinarians from declawing big cats, um, you know, then, then that's, that's one way that, that we can stop it. And so that was, that was another great consequence of our victory last week. But it can also mean that you could create some kind of underground declawing thing where, you know, and you know where where people take their big cats to someone underground and they do it illegally, right? Well, that's certainly possible, but um, you know we have we have members of the public all across the country who are constantly sending us photos and videos of big cats that they see being exhibited, and um, it's pretty obvious when you see a, a big cat's paw. Um, who's been declawed, they're, they're really flat looking. And, and we have veterinarians on staff who are mostly able to look and, and able to, you know, to tell right away. And so it's something that we could jump on really quickly if, um, if we started to see a, a greater prevalence of that. And um, we'll definitely be keeping an eye out for it as, as we are currently. Well, Brittany, uh, I appreciate your good work. And thank you for your time on the PETA podcast. Thank you. Brittany Pete, an attorney and director of captive animal law enforcement at PETA. Don't forget to take out your cell phone and capture video if you see any roadside animal acts and send it on to PETA. Read more about declawing at PETA.org. You can contact us at PETA.org. Find me on Twitter at Emil Amok, that's uh, E-M-I-L-A-M-O-K, or on Amok.com. Once again, thank you for listening. Check out all our episodes on Apple Podcasts, where you can rate and review the show. Really, it helps. It helps us move up in the ratings uh, on, on Apple. And it helps get the word out about the issues you care about. And don't forget, you can always help the animals and PETA, especially if you have Amazon's Alexa. Just say, Alexa, donate to PETA. (music) 
our music is provided by Carbon Works. Check them out on YouTube. And thank you for joining us. This is a special show. It's our 40th show. Who, who would have thunk it when we started this earlier this year? Thank you for being one of the thousands of downloads each month. And join us again next time for more insight into animal rights and the fight for a cruelty-free world on The PETA Podcast. Thank you again for listening. I'm Emil Guillermo.